Hi everyone, um, and welcome to our event, uh, The Hidden Labour of AI. This event is part of a joint series um, between the OII and the TUM Heilbronn. Uh, if so, if you're interested in what we're talking about today, uh, it's your kind of thing, then keep your eyes peeled uh, for future um, events of this kind. We'd also like to start today by thanking the Dieter Schwartz Foundation, uh, whose support um, makes today possible. A little housekeeping before we start and turn things over to our panelists. We're fortunate at the OII to have a really varied audience with a wide range of views, and we request the opinions of others are respected throughout the event. For your awareness, the event is being recorded and will be posted on our website following. Um, please use the Q&A tab to ask questions, uh, and these will be answered towards the end of the talk. Questions will be visible to all attendees and can be upvoted and commented upon. So today we're going to be talking a bit about um, the work associated with AI that we might not always um, find as obvious um, as others. We're very aware, I think, in general of the potential risks associated with AI in the workplace um, and the way in which things like surveillance and work intensification can have a deeply negative impact upon workers. But there's also a flip side to that, a reverse side, and that's not just how workers engage with AI once it's been developed, but the kind of work that is involved in that development itself. And that's what our panelists today are going to talk about. Um, just to, to give some background context, in 2021, the Fair Work Project, which is based at the Oxford Internet Institute, did a report um, on work in the planetary labour market. Now, what we looked at was um, how 17 different global cloud work platforms met some uh, basic standards of fairness. So there were 10 different points that platforms could score and getting 10 out of 10 would indicate um, that perfect 10 would, would not actually be, you know, this is the perfect platform. It would mean that a platform had met the basic standards of fairness that we would expect. Um, what we found uh, was that, you know, the vast majority of platforms did not meet that. Um, very famous ones, Mechanical Turk, for instance, scored a one out of 10. Just two platforms could demonstrate um, that their workers uh, met local minimum wages most of the time. So we really saw a huge range of, of issues and concerns um, with uh, the cloud work um, economy, with the way in which AI is developed, and with the hidden labor we're going to be talking about today. Um, now, I don't want to go on for too long, so I'm, I'm going to launch straight into things. I'm really excited to hear from our speakers today, and I, I hope you are as well. Um, first up, we have uh, Julian Posada. Julian, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, thank you for having me here. I'm Julian Posada, PhD candidate at the Faculty of Information in the University of Toronto, and incoming postdoc and assistant professor at Yale. Awesome. Well, Julian, I, I think you're going to talk to us about a, a brilliant paper on embedded reproduction, right? Well, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Carry on. Thank you very much. I'm going to put my slides very quickly. There we go. Yeah, so this is a sort of nine minute summary of a paper that I published uh, very recently called In Better Reproduction in Platform Data Work. Uh, but I'll actually very quickly uh, post the link to the chat here. And I'm very glad that I have the occasion to uh, present a summary of this paper here because um, this paper draws a lot in one of the, in the research made at the OII, mainly on. Uh, Professor Leon Virta, my Graham and their teens uh, research on embeddedness. And this is sort of a follow up to the paper network uh, and not commodified. Uh, so, without further ado, this is the uh, sort of nine minute summary of this paper. So, when I talk about embedded reproduction in platform data work, um, especially the data work part, I wanted to clarify first. Uh, me and some colleagues call data work all the labor that goes into creating the data sets uh, required for machine learning models to uh, operate. And it's mainly tasks related to the generation of data, the annotation of that data, and the verification of the AI models. And we call that data work. And my research focuses on that data work that is outsourced through digital platforms uh, as part of the gig economy. Uh, so think about mechanical torque, but not mechanical torque. Uh, three platforms I've studied that have anonymized uh, in the paper. And um, my main argument today for all of you is to say that platform intermediation in this case leads to these data workers and their local communities to carry out more social and economic risks associated with online freelancing. And I'm going to unpack this in three parts. First, uh, I'm gonna talk about outsourced data work in Venezuela, which is where my field work was. Second, to talk about the three forms of social support that workers receive in, uh, in the context of Venezuela. And finally, concluding with some uh, remarks. So why Venezuela for outsourced data work? And it's because this country has experienced in the past half decade, uh, an economic crisis. 
Um, it has the highest inflation rates in the world, which peaked in 2018 at 65,000%. And that uh, basically uh, disrupted the local labor market. Many people became unemployed and all of this was exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, so what happened here was that uh, not many, many uh, people who lost their jobs, they were stuck at home and then digital platforms became the main way for many families to have an income in US dollars while the local currency was deeply uh, depreciated because of the hyperinflation. So this economic crisis meant that the government was not present uh, as much as before, there was a shortage of goods and services, uh, and probably uh, food and medicine uh, for families. Uh, public services were there, but they were unreliable. For example, people had access to um, electricity and water, but it came and, and went. Uh, it was not a reliable service. There was limited access to public health care. So many people had to rely, for example, on family members for care uh, because of long lines in hospitals and, and accessible doctors. And finally, COVID-19 recently closed many schools and children went then stuck at home. So you have this situation where families, uh, many lost their jobs, uh, many were stuck at home, but they still had the infrastructures built during uh, years of high oil revenue. And so uh, they were. They had computers, access to the internet, electricity, and that's why for many, um, data work and online platforms became the only way for, to earn an income, a stable income in U.S. dollars and cryptocurrency. But then, uh, as you may all many know, with those who are familiar with the gig economy, um, workers are considered users by these platforms. They're not considered as employees. They don't. Li they like many of the rights associated with employment. For example, they can be fired any very quickly at any time with no explanation or recourse. The wages are also very low. Uh, in many cases, when people talk about mechanical turk, they say, oh, the people can earn a cent per task. In the case of Venezuelans, they could earn even less than a cent per task. They were paid by, like, like for example, one, $1 for 2,000 tasks. Uh, also, many reported uh, social isolation and health issues in those cases. So I conclude actually the same as this paper that I, from the OII that I uh, I've quoted um, that work by but uh, commodified. I found that uh, in this case of Venezuela, because of the crisis and, and the way gig economy passed for street workers, uh, there was a lot of labor commodification and not a less institutional support from the part of the government. Uh, but at the same time, and then at the same time, people then had to rely on their personal networks um, to to survive in this uh, complicated economy. So the next part of the presentation is going to be about the types of social support that. Um, uh, these workers receive when the labor is commodified. And they found three types of social support from three different uh, social circles. The first one from family members. I found that um, families collaborated with tasks. For example, families, entire families, including children, as young as 12 years old would work for platforms under the same account. So as to have, uh, for example, they would have one single computer, but family, family members would rotate around the computer uh, to be constantly working for the platform. I also found uh, that, uh, Workers, of course, rely on the domestic and care labor of family members, notably uh, women at the households, and also that they rely on the financial support of family members, for example, by living in the same household, um, for example, receiving remittances from families abroad. Uh, so there was a lot of financial support among family members as well. The second social circle was from colleagues, um, like in many other research uh, on online labor, it found that workers relied on each other online through, uh, for example, Facebook groups, especially Telegram and WhatsApp uh, closed groups. Uh, these groups uh, would serve as spaces to voice concerns and criticism where platforms would not allow that in internal chats from the platforms. Also trusted networks for transactions. Many workers were paid actually in, on uh, cryptocurrency or through online wallets, and they needed brokers to uh, sell that cryptocurrency or online like US currency into believe and by believers. So they needed trusted sellers and buyers that they could find on those groups. And finally, they also uh, wrote instructions, translated those instructions. Many didn't speak English and instructions were written in English. And many also created guides and they shared them as a shared resource, as a common resource among all workers. And finally, neighbors were also very important, uh, especially in terms of services. Uh, they coordinated access to services they lacked, for example, uh, garbage disposal. Uh, they would, uh, together as a community, uh, pay for a truck to pick up the garbage every month or have access to a pump for those who didn't have access to water and finally share existing resources as well. For example, if a family would suddenly lose access to electricity, they could go to the other house and have it and work from there for a day uh, while their electricity service would uh, come again. So they also just share resources among neighbors was very important for workers to be able to work. And I'm gonna conclude this very quick presentation with three uh, main points. The first one is that 
platforms also impact communities. Uh, platform labor is not an issue only among platforms, clients, and workers, but also the, behind these workers, there are communities that provide, for example, domestic reproductive labor that share common resources that are essential for them to know how to work and also to earn an income uh, in the case of Venezuelans who required uh, brokers. Second, that commodification exacerbates based inequality, but not only inequality in terms of work uh, relations, but also within the household. For example, the fact that uh, women were still providing care and domestic labor for, um, for workers. And finally, that shared resources are essential to social reproduction. Uh, in many cases, research on social reproduction focuses on the households or on welfare, but also communities and shared resources, like in the case of Venezuela uh, sharing uh, electricity or access to water is also important for uh, social reproduction. And I stop there. I'm happy to answer any questions about the paper. Thank you very much for listening to me. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Julian. That was that's really, really brilliant. Um, it's a brilliant paper. I encourage people to go read it. Um, next, we're going to have um, Tim and Charlotte. Um, do you guys want to introduce yourselves and, and start? Yes, gladly. Let me try to quickly share the screen here. So you should now be able to uh, just about exactly see what you're supposed to be seeing, except that it's giving you a little bit more space, but that's okay. Um, so my name is Tim Buter. I um, hold the chair for international relations um, at the TUM um, Hochschule für Politik uh, School of Politics and Public Policy, TUM School of Social Sciences and Technology and TUM School of Management. Sorry for the uh, multitude of affiliations here. Um, I'm going to talk about a project um, that uh, Charlotte and I have been leading from the social science side jointly uh, with some colleagues in mechanical engineering. Charlotte, would you just briefly introduce yourself and, and then I'm gonna start on the slides here. Yes, sure. So my name is Charlotte Unruh. So my, my background is in philosophy and I'm a postdoctoral fellow in applied ethics um, at the Tum Chair for International Relations and working on this project together with Tim Bute. Very good. Thank you. Um, so we already covered that. Um, let me uh, just uh, uh, give this as, as background. We are a diverse team at the Chair for International Relations. Um, most of our work uh, focuses on the political drivers and consequences of international and transnational economic relations, including international trade, foreign investment, foreign aid, development, cooperation, uh, where many of the kinds of, of things um, that uh, Julian just talked about and uh, that others will be talking about are, are very much uh, at, the, at the center. Um, we also look at other issues of international relations um, and particularly interested in, in governing markets and market competition, looking at competition law and policy, um, various aspects of the politics of innovation, regulatory politics and policy, and especially uh, technology governance, which is where this project is above all uh, focused. Um, some of our work uh, in, in recent years also has looked at, at health policy and uh, politics in comparative uh, perspective. Uh, now, the main project that I, um, I'm gonna talk about today here uh, is called the Human Preference Aware Optimization System. And it's very much about AI and work, um, although, um, in, in ways that are focused for the moment primarily at the local level. We look at the way in which AI is used and maybe can be used better uh, in the context of um, processes of scheduling shifts, scheduling or assigning tasks to individual uh, workers or employees, um, something that happens across a broad range of industries. Uh, we look at this empirically specifically in the context of logistics um, which, of course, is something that happens both at the local level and uh, through global value chains very much at the global level with lots of international components as well. Since you have to start somewhere, uh, our focus so far has been primarily, though, at the fairly local level. At the core, uh, what we're concerned about in this project is that um, the increasing use of an availability of, of data uh, creates possibilities, which Charlotte will uh, elaborate on uh, in, in more detail in a minute, um, to essentially ask 
employees to arrange themselves uh, ever more and, and, and in the ways of this, this picture, I thought it was really pretty for that, bend themselves basically uh, around uh, the mechanical needs and opportunities uh, that are identified with the help of AI in industrial processes of various uh, kinds. In part, this is because uh, various aspects of the industrial performance and the sort of more mechanistic elements of workflows in general and logistics in particular are relatively easy to measure. And our ambition in this project is to find ways of measuring um, human needs and preferences, um, needs and preferences of the employees and show that it is possible um, uh, to integrate them uh, based on, on ethical principles that uh, Charlotte will talk about in more detail in, in a moment um, into the optimization of assignments to shifts, assignments of tasks, uh, the general workflow in a complex industrial operation. And with that, um, I will turn it over uh, to Charlotte. Great. Um, thanks, Tim. Yeah, so just um, let me start from there and introduce our research project in a bit more detail. Um, so I guess the, the starting point um, is that digitalization in industry has accelerated over the last years. So I guess, you know, robots have entered factory halls, smart glasses, I guess that's been happening a while ago, but um, smart glasses and tablets are used in warehouses as well. Sensors and tags are attached to goods, are worn by workers, and digital gadgets collect data. So that might be data about workers, it might be data that reveals a worker's location, their pace of work, their error rate, their posture maybe, their, their fitness, their, their motivation perhaps. And that availability of data that can lead to, you know, that leads to performance transparency and that in turn can lead to stress, that can lead to performance pressure. Um, digitalization can intensify work, can lower satisfaction, and of course, it can also give rise to ethical issues. So with all that data available, one question is how we can respect the privacy of workers. And when the data is used um, to you know, support managerial decision-making or maybe even replace it, how can we ensure that these decisions are made in a way that is fair? Um, and I guess finally, how can we ensure that this increasing digitalization um, does not in the end undermine the autonomy um, of workers? And these questions, of course, they're not just technical issues, they are ethical questions, social, political questions. And um, that is why we're trying to tackle them in the interdisciplinary project, um, working with social scientists, engineers, philosophers. Um, and in this project, as Tim already said, we're looking at these issues in the very concrete case of a shift scheduling algorithm in a logistics company. And what we, do, what we are hoping there is to derive insights that can then perhaps be scaled up and used across value chains. But we're looking at this for now um, at a very local level. So let me tell you a bit about that use case. Um, and maybe just to get the basics here. So imagine you're a manager for logistics, the, the logistics area in a company, and you have a shift schedule from Monday to Friday with maybe two shifts each to kind of simplify things. You have some workers, A, B, C, D, you have some workplaces, um, picking items from shelves and maybe driving a forklift. And your task is to assign the workers to the workplaces um, for each shift. Now, as Tim said, our main motivation in this project is to somehow turn a rhythmic optimization in the workplace on its head. So we want to use AI or we want to figure out, find out how, if, and how we can use AI to adapt work processes to the needs and preferences of employees. And what might that mean in our scheduling case? So here's what we do. We ask workers about their preferences and we use the answers for our shift scheduling. So we use as input data, not just the number of employees and the available jobs, but also employee preferences. And we then do um, a matching of employees and jobs with an AI-based algorithm taking into account employee preferences. And what we get is, an, is a recommendation for a weekly schedule that respects these preferences. And what we're also working on is to include a feedback loop so that workers can actually give feedback on, on the shift schedule to feed that back in the algorithm. So how can we respect the autonomy of workers? We can include employee voices in the process of designing and implementing the algorithm, adapting it to specific 
corporate context. Um, we can use self-service applications and interfaces as part of the scheduling system. Um, we're trying to, to ensure that, that you know, privacy rights can be respected by not using um, tracing or performance data as, as input here to um, assign employees to jobs, but rather to use data preferences that we elicit via questionnaires. Um, and we are investigating, we're currently investigating fairness principles and thinking about how the matching algorithm can be, could be adapted to incorporate um, these, these different um, fairness, the different fairness criteria that might be applicable um, in the specific context we're looking at. So taking this together, what we're hoping to do is to contribute to the conversation in the ethics of artificial intelligence about whether a human-centered AI is possible, and if so, what that would look like in the specific context of industry, and even more specifically in algorithmic scheduling. And then hopefully we can use these lessons that we've learned here and try to take them back to the bigger picture and see what we can say here. Thank you, Charlotte. Um, I, I think we can, can leave it at, at that. Um, as we said in the beginning, this project is currently focused much more on, on the local level, but since the kind of issue that we're trying to get at here is something that is, is found uh, at many different levels and across a whole range of, of industries, uh, we're, we're hopeful that in, in principle, the ideas that we've been uh, working on here can be scaled up and ultimately might also contribute um, to fairness in the global distribution of, of work, uh, as well as at the local level, of course. Thanks. Brilliant, all right. Well, thank you so much, guys. That, that question of democratic governance and, and control of work is, is obviously such a, such a serious one. Um, now we're gonna have uh, Jan Marco. Uh, do you wanna introduce yourself? Sure, so my name is Jan Marco Leimester. I'm a professor for information systems um, and I'm affiliated to the University of St. Gallen, Switzerland, and also um, to the University of Kassel in Germany. And um, I'm looking at um, algorithmic work coming from uh, platformized work. So work that happens on platforms. Uh, we heard something like, um, uh, like Amazon Mechanical Turk in the introduction before. Um, but there are many more platforms that go beyond that. And I'm especially interested in knowledge intense collaborative work processes there. And uh, I will start my input by telling you what I will tell you. So basically the punchline will be, I will show you and illustrate that human work processes uh, and also the required competencies um, that are necessary to execute them can be captured and analyzed automatically. So both the two for the task as well as for the human. Um, and I will also illustrate that large jobs can be algorithmically be broke, broken down, down into smaller jobs or even tasks. And then further on, I will illustrate that the matchmaking of jobs and tasks and workers can also be automated, as well as managing the whole task execution in such collaborative settings. And then I will conclude by illustrating that especially the individual skill profiles of digital workers are very critical assets, and they might be candidates um, for regulation in the future, similar to what the European Union is now trying to regulate with the Digital Services Act. I argue that um, a Digital Worker Profile Act might be reasonable um, to consider to leverage um, uh, potentials and at the same time uh, avoid uh, exploitation and abuse of power on platform work. So when speaking about work on platforms, I refer to online labor platforms. So online labor platforms uh, are generally speaking uh, two-sided markets for human work. There are very popular and successful examples out there. So I've illustrated or have uh, chosen Upwork as one example. And for those of you who don't know Upwork, um, I suggest uh, you, you check it out and look at the type of tasks that you can source there. And it is nowadays much more than just the two-sided market it is extending into a collaboration platform where the human work is actually deployed on. And uh, uh, the research group that I've been uh, uh, chairing um, for the last eight or nine years has looked at one particular type of two-sided platforms on, or of online labor platforms. We have looked especially on crowd work platforms. And uh, such crowd work platforms there as a subtype 
are IT-based platforms offering digital tasks via an open call to an undefined number of potential contributors to the crowd. And we have um, especially looked into one particular type of crowd work setups. It's um, the, the setup for software tests. So software testing is a knowledge intense, high skilled um, uh, job. Um, usually university graduates go there to execute that. And this is one of the first examples where we can uh, observe um, a different way of organizing and structuring work so that a knowledge intense um, large task can be broken down algorithmically into many small chunks and pieces and tasks and can be um, distributed to a crowd, which then executes them in parallel. And the result of those tasks that um, uh, the individuals have worked on will then be reassembled into a larger um, uh, outcome. And on top of that, the platform provides all the uh, management processes and routines and also the market supporting services um, to make the economic exchange between a crowdsourcer and the crowdsourcees, the crowd workers, um, a seamless uh, digital experience. So what is that um, telling us about algorithmic management? It'll show us that algorithmic management here can, uh, on the one hand side, um, be understood as um, a support for the matchmaking on these two-sided markets. So um, the algorithms will use input and output data of crowd workers um, to uh, match them to the open and needed um, tasks. And these algorithmic um, uh, elements will also be able um, to optimize liquidity on those marketplaces in the sense of dynamic prices and uh, will make sure that um, transaction costs overall can be minimized. The other thing, and that's the part that might be most interesting to the audience today is, um, as the digitization grows into the execution of these digital tasks, um, the algorithm becomes more and more like a boss, ensuring that um, the way um, of executing the human work on the platforms um, sticks to certain standards uh, and meets certain uh, key performance indicators and um, those algorithms very often use process data to monitor the behavior or, um, and the results um, of people working in such state settings. And on top of that, sometimes even um, does um, something like a nudging to make sure that um, uh, worker behavior is done in a way that um, is supposed to be um, positive for the overall outcome um, of, of um, the collaboration. And generally speaking, such a process can be broken down into, into seven steps. Uh, and um, uh, in the case of um, software taste testing, um, this would be basically starting with um, the overall task, uh, testing, for instance, an app, uh, user interface testing of, of, an, of, a, of a mobile app, for instance, which then can be broken down into uh, smaller pieces um, of uh, jobs to be done. Those jobs to be done in, in app testing usually comprise uh, a workload of 10 minutes maybe, and they will be then distributed among uh, thousands of potential uh, crowd testers. And uh, the way to make sure that uh, a task is only shown to a person that might be suitable or interested in the task is of course done algorithmically, right? And out of that, um, the um, uh, crowd worker then can select which job um, he or she would like to work on. And then the test is performed on the, on the crowd work platform. It is then returned with a bug report. And at the end of the day, um, the different bug reports from all testers are then quality assured and condensed into a joint overall uh, assemble test of the whole software piece. So it's a collaborative process, right? And uh, I will now drill down into one step of that um, process, which is the distribution of jobs uh, or tasks. And uh, how does that work, um, generally speaking? And that's where the algorithmic mapping, um, uh, matchmaking uh, comes into play. Um, so we will uh, analyze every worker based on his or her past performance on the crowd testing platform uh, to extract automatically something that we call a digital twin of his or her skill profile. And that skill data set then uh, for instance, this example would cover um, the, the languages spoken, uh, how good um, the spelling skills are, how uh, and what type of IT skills are around, but also which type of hardware he or she brings to the testing scheme and so on. 
To give an idea of the skill data sets that we analyze, they work with more than a thousand different um, uh, data points in them. So you can see that they're very fine granular and very well um, elaborated. Um, and on the other hand, um, you look at the task um, and also that task can be um, algorithmic, algorithmically decomposed uh, using a digital twin basically of the task profile. And that task set, um, uh, data set then uh, would comprise for instance, the necessary languages and so on and so forth. So you see where this leads. This leads to um, an, an algorithmic matching. Um, and that way you can make sure that potential crowd workers get only displayed uh, suitable tasks and can choose from a um, set of maybe three to five suitable tasks, um, the ones that they prefer most. Now, of course, um, as you might see, the way how I've depicted this um, is, is um, a, a very uh, efficient way of uh, algorithmic management of um, complex collaborative processes. But of course, uh, it raises a lot of questions about whether that is good or not good, or who's um, in danger here, or um, is, that, is that a good future? And Basically, what we can say after eight years of work in that field is it's a very mixed picture and very diverse, right? So uh, what we can tell is that type of software testing, at least, um, has uh, a lot of potential to do software testing faster, cheaper, better, and therefore is uh, economically uh, very interesting. At the same time, uh, it's not uh, um, a, a granted thing that you can leverage all these potentials because it requires a lot of uh, process and managerial knowledge around the work system. For workers, it also is a mixed picture. It has um, additional opportunities to uh, low access barriers to uh, work. So you can work whenever you want. You just turn on your machine and enter your profile. You choose the type of task you want to work in and you're very flexible time-wise, space-wise. So that is something that is very attractive to some crowd workers at the same time. Um, you're competing in some settings on a global level, which puts you under wage pressure potentially. And of course, um, you might be dependent on the goodwill of the platform. Um, if, uh, for instance, um, there are questions about the work quality or the payment. And uh, of course, the type of software testing uh, setup that I've shared with you can be transferred to many knowledge intense uh, collaboration settings also within organizations. So we're currently running large projects with um, uh, multinational German industrial engineering companies that explore that type of work allocation and management um, for internal uh, work processes uh, in order to uh, empower um, their workforce to have more say into what type of jobs they want to work on the next day and on uh, how um, to um, be in the driver's seat um, for uh, their own uh, work um, that they bring uh, to work. And uh, at the same time, we need to be very considerate about if we follow down that road, what route, what that might mean um, for our social systems um, and all the uh, legal uh, requirements that come with this. And I want to highlight one of the most uh, dominant challenges that we come across. Um, uh, it is uh, basically the ownership and the regulation around uh, the workers' um, skill profile. Because uh, in most cases, the skill profile does not belong to the worker, but it's a prerequisite that if you want to change from one platform to the other, you have the same uh, opportunities um, to access um, uh, well-suited, well-paid work. Um, so we would argue for, um, for um, regulatory uh, thoughts in that, in that environment to make sure that um, we can leverage on the one hand side the economic potential of that type of um, organizing digital collaborative work at the same time securing workers' interests um, in a technically automatable way. And with that, uh, I hope to be able to hand back to you in, without having gone too long and look forward to the future uh, questions and interactions. Thanks so much, Dan. It's really interesting, especially highlighting the, the, the dual sides of this, this labour market and the innovations that are associated with this labour market. Um, next, we're going to have uh, Sana. Hi, thank you so much for having me. It's it's yeah, it's wonderful to be here. Thanks for the invitation, Callum, and yeah, to be together with all these fantastic speakers. Um, yeah, I'm Sana Ahmed, and I'm a PhD candidate at the Freie Universität Berlin, and I work as a research fellow at the 
WZ Berlin Social Science Center and the Weizenbaum Institute. Um, and I don't have slides, unfortunately, but I'm going to be talking about content moderation work in IT service value chains and focus primarily on the use of content moderation technology for both controlling work, but also reducing dependence on uh, labor skills. So this, the discussion today will be is informed by um, this recent chapter that my colleague and I wrote together for a book, which is called Digital Work in Planetary Market. I'm putting the link here if you haven't seen it. It's a fantastic book with many interesting contributions. It's edited by Mark Graham and Fabian Ferrari at the Oxford Internet Institute. And so it's informed my discussion today. Uh, um, yeah, my outline today is informed by this chapter, but also my larger sort of research inquiry, my PhD work into content moderation, outsourced work in India. And what I've been doing so far is trying to understand the different value chain configurations and trying to um, see how does that impact work because there are different uh, different kinds of value chains. There are different kinds of impact on work. Um, and before I get into that, maybe I should describe what content moderation is. Content moderation is the screening um, and removal of content, uh, user-generated content on social media platforms. Now, content moderation happens on all different kinds of websites. It happens on e-commerce sites, but my focus is on social media platforms. And uh, media scholars, communication scholars, legal scholars have already established the importance of content moderation for economies of scale for these technology firms such as Facebook, such as Twitter, Google, but also at the same time for maintaining some semblance of public discourse on, on social media. What is not known, however, is the labor behind content moderation. And I think that's largely on account of the secrecy of this work. Um, there are different reasons for, for keeping content moderation, especially outsourcing opaque, is to protect uh, tech propriety. It's to, uh, it's to sort of protect workers from harm from users, et cetera, et cetera. So technology firms uh, insist on the secrecy and then the suppliers in India, the subcontracting firms, I would be calling them suppliers, they are the enforcers of the secrecy and workers are required to sign non-disclosure agreements. So this kind of secrecy also has uh, as implication, sorry, for the, uh, for the organization of work, but also uh, on working conditions. Um, so I found out that there are two kinds of, Martin and I together wrote this chapter, and we found two kinds of uh, value chains, uh, market-based and captive. Um, and what this actually showed us that there are, uh, and these have impacts on governance mechanisms, the coordination mechanisms, um, the different arrangements that technology firms operating social media platforms and suppliers in India which could be, of course, subsidiaries of multinational enterprises, but they could also be small and medium enterprises, into, on, uh, independent enterprises in India. Um, the arrangements between them to extract value from worker, to ensure productivity from worker, that differs according to these, uh, according to these chains. But at the same time, there is, there is high power asymmetry that we saw um, in these chains. What this means is that the technology firms control the clients, they control um, standards, they control policies regarding content moderation, but at the same time, they also control uh, the software, the content moderation um, um, software that is primarily used for moderating content. So this is where I jump in now and try to connect it um, to, the, to the discussion in this panel. Um, the use of technology is very interesting uh, because, of course, as I mentioned, it allows the centralization of control over, over the labor process, over the production process with the clients, the technology firms, but also it allows for micromanagement of work, right? So there is, um, and that micromanagement happens on two levels. One is direction of tasks. So tasks are fragmented to... Um, to very small levels, and then they are directed to workers. And um, let me also explain, there's a lot of context here. 
Um, so what is, what is the kind of content that workers are moderating? It's the flagged content. There are different levels of, uh, of moderation happening, reactive, proactive, all of this you can also read in the chapter. I don't have enough time to um, talk about it, but just very quickly, this is flagged content. Users, social media users have flagged, that is reported the content on the platforms. And then this flagged content is directly uh, transferred to workers in outsourced locations, India, Philippines, etc. I look at India, which is one of the main locations for outsourcing this work. This work is directed in different uh, queues. So um, this technology allows these, technolo uh, these firms, these clients to direct the work to uh, flagged content to the workers, but also at the same time monitor it. There are very specific mechanisms of monitoring workers' times, compressing times, how much time they spend between each piece of content or within their workday, um, productivity time, break times, et cetera, et cetera. So they control that as well. Um, so this, all of this allows them to micromanage at the distance. So it's highly controlled and highly standardized work, but at the same time, I've also observed uh, labor agency in this kind of work that primarily happens through using their own skills and um, tacit knowledge for responding to content that does not have answer in the content moderation standards that are developed by technology firms. So this is based on the idea that social media landscape is highly uncertain. It's constantly changing. Um, there are, there's a need for, um, there's a need for responding to the constant changing of uh, of, of content um, and the discourse on, on social media, which technology firms, of course, try to. Um, they try to have these, um, these standards that, that can respond to these challenges. At the same time, there are situations where workers need to make use of their, um, their value judgment, their tacit knowledge, and respond to this content. Now, the content coming to the workers is not just from India. It's coming from different parts of the world. Um, what is, however, happening because this uncertainty and what is uh, called as labor indeterminacy in labor process analytical terms um, creates issues for the for 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 companies, and they want to reduce this indeterminacy, um, which is why the technology allows the companies to codify the knowledge, the tacit knowledge, the skills well, the tacit knowledge of the workers into this system. What happens uh, from this is that not only are the workers not, uh, not only are the workers not valued, so this does not result for any rewards or economic valuation for them, but at the same time, it's also increasingly reducing those spaces of, of applying tacit knowledge. Um, workers also experience de-skilling through this continuous standardization of work um, that is happening in content moderation. Unsurprisingly, there are very high levels of attrition, um, attrition in this work. So I'm going to stop at that, um, and I'm very happy to answer any questions and discuss uh, more on this. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's, that's really interesting. I, I think that there's been a consistent thread here about um, many of the risks that workers working in these kind of environments are facing. And it, it's great to have so many perspectives that draw from Venezuela, from, from India, from so many different geographical contexts as well. Um, just before we move on to the, the q and I want to take the opportunity quickly to introduce some of the work that we're doing um, at the OII to put in context where we're kind of going on questions like this and what our immediate um, frontiers are. Currently, I work on a project between the OII and the global project, uh, the Global Partnership on Artificial Intelligence, the GPAI, um, looking specifically at how we can um, introduce ethical principles that take what's at the heart of the OECD uh, principles on ethical AI and apply them specifically to the workplace. So looking at how these things can kind of be translated from that more general context into the specific questions of power and um, the specific relationships that emerge from um, production. Uh, one of the questions we're really interested in at the moment and one of the things we're really trying to think about and this event has been really helpful in, in framing is how um, tech companies have a responsibility in um, looking at what how they're procuring and developing AI um, as well as just in, in the end user instance. So both in 
you know, if you're in a warehouse where you're being scheduled by AI, there are both ethical questions about how that scheduling has been applied to you, but also fundamentally questions about how that scheduling AI was developed in the first place, right? Um, so we're trying to look both ways, right? From, from this kind of central point, we're looking, looking down into the immediate workplace, um, often located in the global north and, and up the chain towards what's happening before that. Um, and I think it's really useful to think about the power that large technology companies apply up that supply chain. And I think, uh, you know, I'm not a, I'm, a, I'm a sociologist at heart, not a philosopher. But for me, there always seems to be a fundamental principle that with, with um, greater power comes greater responsibility in, in questions of ethics. So that concentration of power um, as procurers, I think, is, is really important. And one of the things we have to bear in mind when paying attention to cloud work. So if people are interested in that, um, the GPAI will be publishing uh, that report, hopefully by the end of the year, but you never know. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll be, we'll be having a discussion about that in, in six, eight months time. Um, so it'd be, it'd be great to engage with people in the audience further at that point. So without further ado, I, I kind of want to pass over to, to um, Helmut and the, the Q&A. Thanks, Callum, and thanks to all of you for really making a fascinating uh, presentation. My name is Helmut Kretschmer. I'm the presidential delegate of uh, Technical University of Munich for the new campus in TUM Campus L1, as already mentioned in the beginning, um, an instrument that I'm bringing together the works of the Oxford Internet Institute uh, and the work that we're doing at uh, to Munich at various locations. Personally, I'm an information systems professor with a high interest in the inner relationship between using information and com communication technologies on the global scale and the ways that changes work organization, task organization, political relationships, work relationships, because I think that is a very interesting part. And what I heard in the panel discussion before we go to the questions, which I would invite you to put in the end questions and answer session, I have two questions, so that doesn't count for the next 11.5 um, minutes. Um, what I, I've seen is um, that it's very interesting um, twofold idea that we came along. I think in the first part, we looked at uh, global work relations. So, Tim, Charlotte, uh, and Julian looked at uh, what happens if you actually can distribute work to other locations, and uh, specifically what happens if you look at the data work behind the things we take for granted. And I'm grateful for the uh, people to show us that uh, this work that has been distributed can come in testing, can come in content moderation, can come in many other areas like tagging pictures and whatsoever we had um, in the early years. But it, it has a different um, connotation because in the micro tasks that we actually do, I think once we talked about pickup jobs, not just micro, but really very small, um, pickup jobs that can be distributed. And then suddenly something happens that we have seen described by Sana and Jan Marco that work organization changes dramatically. Uh, the way we can actually move from giving a larger task and not look at every step of its um, performance, but to really do what I would call automated algorithmic micromanagement from a distance based on many data elements. And the last question that we have to look at was at the role that in knowledge management for knowledge workers and perhaps all data workers, we have so nicely put on the effects of tacit knowledge that if you observe enough instances, you might even automate or um, codify some of the tacit elements. Perhaps not everything, but just even more to again uh, micromanage. I started to talk that long because I wanted to give our listeners a little more time to try type questions. Um, because one of the areas that uh, the, came forward by Keegan McBride was the question about the state. Um, Keegan, excuse me, but uh, the state is pretty tough. Uh, if you have all of the nations uh, that we have with labor regulations, but it is a question on how would one regulate and how would one try to regulate. And I heard one proposal where I'd like to ask Jan Marco and Sana get into some kind of uh, interaction. If I look to call for a digital worker profile act as a technologist, I think of uh, semantically open interoperational standards where it's not somebody who worked for owns your data, but you own your own data. And for those of us that are in health, you know that the HIPAA Act uh, made sure that medical data isn't belonging to the doctors, as we see in some countries, um, or the machines that create the data, but to the person. 
or object uh, the data is being created about. Um, and I think that would be an interesting debate. And Sana just talked about that uh, content moderation work is secret for a number of reasons. Um, perhaps, perhaps the workers that do content moderation work talk about it at home. So there their work is in secret, but it's secret in terms of a overview. And the same thing happens to testing, which is an interesting notion that the two panelists got different viewpoints, but it's describe a similar mechanism of higher profiles, higher data about. Um, Sana, what do you think about um, the, the, the proposed uh, Digital Worker Profile Act so people could take their individual work capabilities in this micros microscopic area from one place uh, to the next one? And to Jan Marker, how should the European Union add its GTBR regulations, even though it's a Workers' Act? Sana, first. Um, yeah, thank you so much for your questions. I don't know about this uh, this act, um, unfortunately, so I can't really comment. I'm not there yet. Yeah. Don't worry. Right. Or okay. don't be hopeful, okay. whichever okay. way of the mixed okay. Picture. okay. But just in terms of your comment about the secrecy of the work, it does not just extend in the workplace, but also in the social life of workers. Because this is psychologically distressing work on many different levels, but in terms of also the kind of content that they see, um, a lot of times they have to watch hate speech, uh, pornographic content, et cetera, et cetera. So they're unable to even talk about the, with their families, right? So there's a lot of resilience happening in this work in terms of why why they join this work in terms of why they continue working with these working conditions uh, because they want to sort of step up in their career. There is also a sort of a positive association with working with overseas clients, et cetera, et cetera. But at the same time to get social help is very difficult. Now, this is something that was observed in my uh, research uh, field work uh, during COVID when the lockdown happened, stringent lockdown happened in India, everything had to be shut down in 2020 in March and workers were required to work from their homes. They were given their desktops, um, everything was given because it's so highly secretive, even in terms of the hardware, they were given desktops and the people who were living with their families who did not have their own working space, a room of their own could not work because this is something that you couldn't do when staying in a house, sharing your home with a family. So you could see that the secrecy not just extends in the workplace, but also in the social life and how that also affects, um, yeah, how, how that also affects like asking for help. I also very quickly wanted to um, suggest, uh, just make a quick comment regarding the state's role. Um, Global production network theories offer a lot of examples about the role of state that I'm also using in my own research, which is not just the role of state in actually creating infrastructure for these companies, but also mediating or not mediating the capital labor relations. Thanks. So I'm sure go back to the um, labor market regulations, privacy, and other issues to the first two presenters. But and Marco, you look for the uh, Protection Act to get your data across. Is that a reality already? Is it um, set up? Would you see a sanitization organization to provide the task description elements that you need for such an algorithm? First of all, let me say, why do we come up with that idea? Uh, because we see that um, the, the measuring everything that happens on platforms is happening, no matter what, right? And the question is, um, who owns um, these resources if they're collected anyway? Right? And the only way how you can make sure that you can um, have your fair share of that is that if you are in the driver's seat of what is collected about you while you work, and um, if, if you can take um, the, the, the aggregated value coming out of the profile that can be used for other online labor platforms with you. So it's basically making sure that whatever you worked as a track record, right, as, an, as a sign of excellence of, of your work execution uh, stays with you. And we're considering options, technical options, how to make that feasible and interoperable. And um, I'm not, uh, I'm not going to go into into details. But distributed ledger technologies offer wonderful opportunities. How to make sure that you're in the driver's seat, and a third party um, has only rights to um, edit uh, in certain areas what you deem uh, acceptable, and so on and so forth. So that's a technical approach, how you could enforce that. And you could even think about extending that into what you have in ERP systems within companies, where we also collect data about workers, job descriptions, work performance, but on a much more um, uh, 
not as granular and as fine grained as, as maybe uh, we see already on the online labor platforms. And if we do a fast forward uh, and, and think about what, what's very likely to happen, then we will see that things will get much more fine granular and that people will start working in multiple contexts and not just for one employer, but for many, and they will move. And, and everything that comes out of this volatility that we see on the labor market, and the only way how you can stay up up to speed to that is by uh, owning your profile, owning your data, and taking it with you. And, let me and take that question. Let me take that issue to Charlotte and Tim, because part of the shift planning is the voicing of individual preferences when you would like to work, when you would like to do something that's based on very individual uh, decisions that you might don't really want to disclose, but you want to have it uh, respected. Um, in your experience, um, in your area, is the ownership of when somebody would like to work owned by the company or owned by the individual worker? And is it adequately in a certain content disguised? And what does it belong? But that, does that do to your rights of privacy not to talk about everything that's on your mind, whether you want to get up early or do sports or whatever, whatever comes to you might think of? I know that, for example, in uh, the Netherlands, it's of course to be stated, well, no, kindergarten is closed. In some other countries, that's a big issue not to be mentioned. I think that's one of the very interesting parts in the shift plan area. Charlie, okay, do you want to start? Yeah, any, any ideas? Any insights? Who owns the data that you use for shift plan? The employer, if it's in Germany. Yeah, but um, do you want to go to another place? Do you need to have, enter all the details again? Or can you bring your, that's my work schedule. I'm an owl and up in the night and I'm, a, I'm an early bird. So I like to do stuff in the morning. Um, and I think that's very sensitive information we saw in hospital shift plan. Yeah, so I think um, one thing we can say is that this is obviously very sensitive information when it comes to personal preferences. And I think one point to make there is that it's, I mean, that is that is one of the reasons why we think it's really important to um, go into companies on a local level and talk not just to employees, but also, also to, the, to the workers themselves and um, really discuss what kind of preferences it might make sense to include, what kind of preferences they'd be happy to include in that kind of system. Um, and that that might obviously that that might be very different from place to place. So what we what we are finding is that there's that, that there's unlikely to be a one size fits all solution to the scheduling system. So it has to remain adaptable, um, and different kinds of data might go in there depending on depending on the um, specific I'd like case. Julian, in the remaining two minutes before I go back to Jan Michael, um, a short uh, question. You looked at. Um, the interrelationship between individualized, very small work and the relationship of other support systems. And I think it's very interesting to note from Sana that my question about the support systems for content moderation workers is answered with its secret. So it's not that easy to gain support from people that are not in your work community. In, in your case, uh, did you see things like local unions of crowd workers? Uh, getting together because if you work uh, in that organizational form, that might be a possible way to support. Yeah, so one of the uh, forms of support that I observed was from workers, and they actually were very. Um, there were many groups of workers on social media that were organized. Actually, like um, if you wanted to be part of this group, you had to pay a fee of uh, one two dollars per month. You had to bring you uh, like give your ID, uh, your address. They, uh, to create trust because basically that's what they needed to create a, tr a trust and these were small groups 60 people 100 people um but they were not um what you could say let's say historical western traditional unions that would like bargain for better working conditions and so on uh what they wanted was to basically um survive the economic crisis and increase their pay that's why they created the guides for example some had bots that would like uh, wake the workers at 3 a.m. because the task would be posted so they could go and work. Um, and uh, yeah, create trust because there is a lot of fears of scam. There's a lot of fears of, uh, um, for example, selling your cryptocurrency and not receiving back uh, payment in, in local currency. 
So that's why they also need to create a lot of trust. So yes, there's some work forms of work organization, um, as I said, with fees, with everything, uh, but they're not, again, because of the conditions of the market, a local economy, and also how peak work is, uh, they're not, what do you consider traditional Western unions in that sense, like in the, in the 19th century sense of a union, for example, uh, oh, or something really very particular for this task. case. I'm really yeah. getting a tough task. Um, it's past our time um, and quite obvious uh, the topic we got together to discuss um, the hidden labor of why to look behind what is actually being done and what's necessary to be done to make AI algorithms work. And what happens if you do that work in terms of micromanagement? What happens if you do that in terms of software as control mechanisms and what that does to, to the notion of knowledge work where we always think that empathetic and tacit knowledge um, is so important. Um, we are exactly what scientists do. We talk about an hour about very interesting issues and we find more fascinating questions. Um, and with that, I do my due excuses to Andrew Jabilski for not um, asking the question, what would be the adequate micro crowd working platform for our scientific work? Um, perhaps you've given us the next topic that can we can actually look at, but I would like to uh, conclude um, by thanking our partner, the Oxford Internet Institute, for pushing us to that really fascinating topic. I would like to thank our panelists, Sana and Charlie, Yamako, Julian, Tim, and the moderator, Callum Hand, and all the organizers behind uh, to bring us a, our fascinating new questions. And I think we touched on um, things that are important to study, and they're important to study not just from a technology or a sociologist, but also from a work and philosophically and legal legal area. And they do touch because it's global work um, on global issues. They demand for um, global discussion on where is the fairness. And I think we hopefully brought people together that without us wouldn't have necessarily talked uh, to each other yet. It looked like that. Uh, we will go on with the, uh, with the session. We continue with the session of AI and work, um, probably in two months as the next date in this webinar form, and I'm glad we have recorded it. I thank all the participants that listened uh, and were here, and I hope that you got your time's worth of added ideas for new research, and I hope to see you again, perhaps even in a real format, if that's possible again. Thank you, and um, have a great day.